so the um, next part of our exam is uh, the ear exam. So typically, always, like with any organ system, we'll start just with inspection. So you just look at the, at the ear. You're looking for um, skin lesions or, or irritations or things like that. This is a very common place for basal cell uh, carcinomas of the skin. So you want to really make sure you look at the entire helix of the ear. Uh, then we do auditory um, acuity testing. So Liz, I'll ask you to um, take your right hand and uh, put your right finger in your right ear. And I'm going to whisper something to you on this side, if you can tell me what I whisper. Bicycle. Bicycle. OK. And if we can do that on the, right si on the left side. Marble. OK, and if the patient doesn't hear it, you can just get increasingly louder. It's a very gross estimation of, of acuity, obviously, but it would certainly help you screen for any large uh, hearing deficits. The next part of the ear exam is the otoscope exam or otoscopic exam. So you need to go over and get your otoscope. You'll need an ear speculum on the end of the otoscope. And uh, generally, I recommend uh, a bit of posterior retraction of the outer ear. That straightens out the ear canal and makes it easier to see the tympanic membrane, which is what we're looking for. And very gently place the speculum uh, into the external auditory canal and take a look for the tympanic membrane. Liz, yours is normal. Uh, then to go to the other side, I typically wrap uh, the cord around the back of the patient. That way the cord isn't hitting the patient in the face. And I repeat that on the other side, again with posterior retraction. Now, uh, in an adult, uh, this kind of method works well. In a child, you'll often uh, see that people will hold the otoscope a little bit differently. Because this way, you have your hand to brace against the patient's head. That way, Liz, if you can move your head a little bit. That way, if the patient moves their head, especially a young child may move their head, especially if they don't want you to be looking in their ear or they have ear pain. You'll have a little bit um, better way to brace your hand uh, against the patient and move with them. You can see if a patient would move their head and you're like this, uh, you could really do some damage to someone's um, ear canal, which of course in someone who's already symptomatic and maybe having ear pain would not be a good idea. But generally for adults especially, uh, this kind of method works just fine. Now to test for sound conduction, we do a couple of tests. One is called a RINA test. And Liz, I'm going to ask you uh, if you hear the vibration. Yes. Mm -hmm. And please tell me when that vibration, when you no longer hear it. No. OK. And then you place the tuning fork in front of the ear canal again. Initially, the tuning fork is placed on the mastoid process, which is the bony prominence just behind the ear. And that's testing for bone conduction. Then when you place it here uh, by the ear canal, that's air conduction. And typically, as in Liz's case, air conduction is greater than bone conduction. She hears it longer um, at the air conduction than the bone conduction area. And again, we would do that on the other side. So again, place it on the mastoid process. Liz, tell me when you no longer hear that. No. And again, do you hear that still? Yes. Very good. So that's normal also. The second test of sound conduction is called the Weber test. And for the Weber test, again, we have to activate our tuning fork. And Liz, I'm going to place this on the top middle of your head and ask you, do you hear that on one side, both sides, or right down the middle? Both sides. Good. Both sides or right down the middle is the normal um, conduction or the normal response. Very good. Now we're going to move on to the nose. And you can inspect the outer nose fairly easily. To inspect the inside of the nose, uh, we'll again use the uh, otoscope, although well, you may want to change the speculum on the end. Liz, I'll ask you to look up just slightly. You want to be careful not to touch the nasal septum because that's a very sensitive area of the nose, but we're looking inside for uh, whether or not the mucosa is inflamed or boggy and swollen. And Liz, you look very normal. 
Next, I'm going to um, palpate your sinuses, all the sinuses of the front of your face. Uh, typically, I'll place my hands on the side of your head, and these are the frontal sinuses and the maxillary sinuses. Liz, I wonder if you tell me, is this painful in any way on one side or the other? No. And how about here? No. Very good. Uh, next, we'll look at uh, the oropharynx and the mouth. So Liz, I'll ask you to open up, please. Open up your mouth, thank you. And we're going to take a look at teeth and the buccal mucosa. You want to take a look at someone's gums. May I look under your tongue, please? Very good. Now, Liz, if, I, if you can say ah. Ah. Very good. And what, what, what I'm doing is observing uh, Liz's palate raising up, which is normal. Uh, now moving on to the neck. Uh, the first part of the neck exam is examining for lymph nodes. So again, using both of my hands, I start posteriorly. There's some occipital lymph nodes right here at the back of the neck, at the occiput of the head. Then there's some uh, posterior auricular lymph nodes and some pre-auricular lymph nodes. And Liz, you have none of these. And then right here at the angle of the jaw is the tonsillar lymph node. And these are submandibular lymph nodes. And there's a submental lymph node. And then these are the anterior cervical chain and the posterior cervical chain. And again, you're feeling all of these areas for any sort of uh, lymph node enlargement or firmness of any lymph nodes. But Liz, you're normal, and I can't feel any lymph nodes. Uh, also, we want to examine the supraclavicular fossa. Here's the clavicles. So Liz, if you can put your hands on your hips and bring your arms forward, you can see the nice um, depression that we get there, and that makes it very easy to feel for any supraclavicular lymph nodes. And again, you're normal. Great, you can relax. Uh, the next part of the neck exam is examining the thyroid. So I'm going to go around uh, behind you, and uh, you want to place your fingers just below the cricoid cartilage. And Liz, I'm going to ask you if you could swallow for me, please. Good. That's very hard sometimes for people to do when you're examining them. So sometimes what you can do is uh, get a small cup of water, ask someone to hold the water in their mouth, and then when you get your hands on, ask them to then swallow the water while you're feeling. Uh, then you want to actually press over to the left side and do the same thing with the patient swallowing, and then over to the right side. And again, ask the patient to swallow and feeling for both the left and the right thyroid lobes. Uh, what we're looking for is thyromegaly, which is enlargement of the thyroid gland, or for thyroid nodules.